Welcome, thank you for coming today to How to Be a Massively Parallel Postgres DBA. On the agenda for today, we have introductions, backgrounds, and baseline definitions, followed by the similarities between Postgres and Greenplum, and then a section on some of the differences and the benefits, uh, the value provided by Greenplum. Then we'll talk about the power of parallel, the extensions that uh, are available in the environments, and finally follow up with some resources and question and answer time. So I'm Randy Willard. I'm a principal data engineer here at Pivotal. I've been with uh, Greenplum, EMC, and Pivotal throughout uh, the last eight years, uh, working with a number of customers. Uh, and previously, I worked at Sun Microsystems, uh, informing software, and a few other places. Uh, my career has been focused on the big data end of things. And with me today is Pravin Rao. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Pravin Rao. Uh, I am a data engineer for the central region of Pivotal Data Engineering. I've been with Pivotal for about three years now, and uh, I've worked with a number of customers such as FCA, Allstate, GE Transportation, and others. And um, before this, I used to work at IBM. And so both Randy and I are here today to talk to you about Greenplum. So a little bit of background on Pivotal and Greenplum itself. So Greenplum started 15 years ago. It actually started off as two companies, which were started by Luke Lonergan and Scott Yara. They were initially working on different data solutions at their startups, but overall they shared a very similar vision for a next generation database product. And uh, when they met in 2003, uh, they formed Greenplum. And in the, in the early days of Greenplum, they were looking for an open source database to base their product on. And after, evol after evaluating several products, they had decided that Postgres was the most feature complete database and it had one of the largest communities and uh, it was the database that most closely aligned with their vision. So after a few years of development, Greenplum went on sale for the first time in 2007, became commercially available. And a few years later, uh, it was bought out by EMC. So in that same year, Greenplum had become uh, enterprise ready after adding several major features to the product. And uh, one of them was uh, the high availability feature known as mirroring in Greenplum. And uh, so in 2012, uh, Greenplum purchased Pivotal Labs and later both Greenplum and Pivotal Labs became a part of Pivotal, which was spun out of EMC in 2013. And uh, since then, Greenplum has matured quite a bit as an MPP database. Uh, and mostly it's uh, due to the research and development uh, adopting the agile uh, development methodology. And this has allowed Pivotal to release uh, minor versions of Greenplum at least once every month and major versions about once a year. And uh, the R&D's Agile development also allowed for one of the biggest major version releases, Greenplum 5, um, last year. And uh, this is significant due to the changes that were made to the co code base, which uh, I'll talk about a little bit later. And in 2018, we had the Greenplum Summit to talk about all of this. So those of you watching this presentation right now may have seen the title in the beginning and wondered what, what the massively parallel part of the title actually meant. So to explain the concept, uh, let me try giving you an example. So imagine you had a standard deck of cards with 52 cards and you were asked to look for the ace of spades. You could flip each card one by one and look for it yourself until you find your result, which could take you alone up to 52 card flips to find what you're looking for. However, if I ask you along with three other people to look for it, I would be able to split the deck into four, four smaller piles amongst the four, four people and yield a much quicker result. So that essentially is what massively parallel processing is. It is the coordinated processing of a, pro, uh, of a program by multiple systems 
through a messaging interface to coordinate the processing of data. So these, these systems all have their own CPU, memory, and storage, and perform their own work in order to produce the final results together. So this is something we also call a shared nothing or loosely coupled architecture. So if you take the concept of massively parallel processing, and if you apply it to Postgres, you have Greenplum. So Greenplum is essentially several Postgres database instances combined into one database system or cluster. Um, and they're all designed to work together in parallel. So in a Greenplum system, each individual Postgres database has its own CPU, its own memory and disk sliced out of it, uh, out of the host system. And each Postgres database in a cluster is what we refer to as segments or segment instances. And each node um, runs several segment instances in a segment host. So normally in a production environment, you would have a Greenplum cluster where you have a master host and several segment hosts within each that um, uh, within each cluster that store the data. However, you can even set it up as a single node. Uh, this is something we at Pivotal do a lot for quick, de quick deployment and testing purposes. And the secret sauce is the integration of the instances and the communication amongst the segment databases. And what, Gre what gives Greenplum its power is its parallel nature. And with many years of development on our query optimizer, which, which is known as Orca, um, it has only gotten more powerful. And this is a feature available in Greenplum um, alongside the Postgres planner. So, uh, and also to give you a little bit more background for you, um, in the initial stages of Greenplum, we based Greenplum on Postgres 8.2, but we branched off from there and started doing our own development for it. But with all the new features that were made available in Postgres 9, we made the decision to realign Postgres with the main Postgres branch. So with our most, uh, with our most recent version release, uh, which is Greenplum 5, uh, we took a major step in upgrading the core Postgres version from 8.2 to 8.3. So this actually prepares us to move to Postgres 9 in our upcoming major version release, which we plan on releasing sometime in early 2019. And after Pivotal released Greenplum to the open source community in 2015, we were able to get contributors from all over, to the, wor from all over the world to help make Greenplum the ultimate data solution. Uh, the open source Greenplum is available on greenplum.org, or it could be uh, installing with a simple app get for Ubuntu users. So uh, let's explore some of the similarities between Greenplum and Postgres. Um, you may be familiar with Postgres, which is an open source object relational database management system. And this right here is the biggest similarity, which is Postgres, because Greenplum is based on Postgres. And uh, while we don't explicitly call Greenplum an RDBMS, we do embrace that aspect of Postgres. Uh, Greenplum is fully featured. Uh, it's a fully featured data platform that provides powerful and rapid analytics on petabyte scale volumes. So a lot of tools you use in Postgres are uh, similar in Greenplum as well. Uh, the psql command, for example, is something that all Postgres DBAs have used at one point or another. Uh, it's a command line tool used in Greenplum as well. Um, you know, you can use psql to log into a database or execute commands. So you also have the client GUI tool, pgadmin, which allows you to connect to your database, but with a nice graphical interface. And with the release of Greenplum 5, PG Admin 4 is now supported as well. So Greenplum is actually actively working with the, the community on a version of PG Admin, um, which will allow Postgres to support Greenplum extensions. And the PG tools that you'll find in Postgres are also available in Greenplum. Uh, the backup and restore utilities, for example, uh, PG dump and PG restore, they work 
almost exactly the same. Also, a lot of other utilities are augmented with uh, the Greenplum versions. For example, one would start and stop a Greenplum using GP start and GP stop. So, but actually the PGCTL utility is called behind the scenes of GP start and GP stop to start or stop the cluster. Next. And just to show you how similar the two actually are, here's a, a screenshot of the PSQL interface. So um, if, you're, if you're a Postgres DBA or if you have ever worked with the Postgres CLI, this will look very familiar to you. Uh, more than 90% of the commands you see in Postgres are exactly the same in Greenplum. Uh, some basic ones shown here include the backslash L to list databases and backslash D to list relations. The extensions are pretty much the same on Greenplum as well. Uh, only difference is they're faster on Greenplum. So you have the PG Crypto extension, which is supported on both Greenplum and Postgres. Uh, so if you're not familiar with PG Crypto, it's, it's an inexpensive solution that allows you to encrypt your data at rest. You also have the Madlib extension for machine learning in SQL, and that's available in both Postgres and Greenplum as well. Only in Greenplum, it's much more powerful since it takes advantage of the massively parallel architecture. And below you will see a few examples of both uh, of Madlib and PG Crypto. So it's, it's all the same with geospatial analytics as well, um, just like Madlib. Um, it is supported on both Postgres and Greenplum, but it runs parallelly on Greenplum. So on the screen, uh, you can, here's an example of how a geospatial function can be created in Greenplum using the familiar SQL language. So now let's take a look at some of the differences between the two. And next slide. Um, perhaps the biggest difference here uh, between Postgres and Greenplum is something that we've already touched on quite a bit throughout this presentation, and it is the massively parallel processing part. Postgres is a single instance uh, compared to Greenplum, which consists of several Postgres instances working together. Uh, another big difference is a concept called distribution, which Randy here will be talking about more in detail. But this is a very uh, important concept to understand since Data is distributed across the cluster in Greenplum, and it can affect your performance quite a bit. And Greenplum also has what we call polymorphic storage. So this starts with partitioning, which, you know, Postgres also has partitioning, but Greenplum has it, uh, does it a little bit differently. So Greenplum uh, has the ability to add compression at different levels. So it could be at the table, partition, or the column level. Uh, the, the storage option can be set when you partition a table. So um, each individual par partition can its, have its own row or column orientation, and it can have distinct, distinct storage attributes. So it could be row oriented, column oriented, or you can say that one of your partitions uh, is S3, so it can access external data from S3. So more of the differences or the common functionalities here between Postgres and open source Greenplum. So Postgres uses what's known as foreign data wrappers to access uh, data external to the database. Um, the data can reside in MySQL or any other external data source like that. Greenplum, Greenplum can also use, uh, Greenplum can also access external data but it does it a little bit differently. So it uses what's known as external tables. So um, I believe Randy will be going over this a little bit more in detail, but uh, usually you when you create a table, you would create an external table and specify the location of your data. So there are different protocols that could, that could reach this data. Uh, for example, GPF dist uh, allows you to access files hosted on a different system, or if you're, use, if you're accessing Hadoop data, you can use the GPHDFS protocol or PXF. 
and um, there, there are many other ways to access data, um, data sources like S3. <clears throat> so one other difference here is something we've already talked about, but it's a single instance of Postgres compared to a multiple, uh, several instances working together on Greenfoam. So again, uh, this has to do with the, the massively parallel part. So with Postgres, you have single threaded utilities, but with Greenplum, your utilities and your extensions run in parallel because of the architecture. And with Postgres, if you were to, um, if you wanted to expand your cluster, uh, this would normally require you to migrate to a more powerful system with more resources and more storage. Uh, in Greenplum, it's different. Uh, it's a simple GP expand option. Uh, it's, a, it's a utility that's, that allows you to simply add nodes and it allows you to expand while your database is still up and running. In addition to the open source features that are available, um, there are also uh, additional features that are available in the Greenplum commercial release. So resource management is, um, it uses uh, Linux C groups in, in the commercial version. Greenplum, uh, the commercial version also supports a GP text, which is used for rapid full text analytics. It also has the Greenplum command center, which is a graphic user interface um, that allows you to monitor and manage your Greenplum cluster using a web interface. And there are several other features that are available um, in the commercial version that, that aren't available in the open source. Uh, database, uh, the ODBC, JDBC drivers uh, that are offered by Progress DataDirect come with the commercial feature or the commercial version. And you also have your Spark and Gemfire connectors that allow you to in integrate Greenplum with these uh, in-memory uh, data grids. Now to you, Randy. Perfect, thank you, Pravin. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the parallel nature of Greenplum at this point. Uh, on this screen, we will see a, a high-level architectural diagram. You'll note on the left is the client that the client connects through the master. The master has a corresponding node called the standby master, which is there for uh, <clears throat> an active passive failover situation. In the middle, we've got uh, redundant interconnects or switches. And finally, on the right side, uh, you'll see segment servers, which are kind of the units of parallelism, if you will. Uh, each segment will have a primary uh, segment set up as well as mirrors, seg mirrored segments established as well. As you can see, when data comes into the cluster, it initially gets written to the primary and subsequently gets written directly to its mirrored pairs, thus providing high availability and redundancy within the cluster. It's also recommended that the disks on which the uh, segments keep their data uh, are all RAID 5 or better protected. As Pravin mentioned, distribution is critical in a, a parallelized database such as Greenplum. Uh, it is how we take data and spread it across the cluster. Uh, <clears throat> there are three methods, uh, and you functionally have to choose one of these or it will be chosen for you. They are hash, random, and replicated with the hash distribution, which is we most commonly use. Uh, <clears throat> you provide a key or a set of keys which on which a hash is calculated and that hash is used to distribute the data across the cluster. In a random distribution, we use a semi round robin distribution pattern to make sure that most, that all segments have an approximately equal amount of data. And finally, uh, with the most recent release, we offer replicated distribution, which allows you to place small tables on every node. Uh, finally, performance gains can be quite significant uh, when you have your distribution set up correctly providing what we call co-located or local joins. Um, and then finally, their hash distribution is recommended for all larger tables. Uh, as you can see in the diagram on the right side, uh, we've got a, a order table with order numbers uh, and some other columns. And you can see that the, 
distribution is done based on the order number column, and you can see across the three segment hosts that we have, in, in fact, distributed the data evenly. Next, the table partitioning uh, capabilities uh, provide some, some very powerful functionality for GreenPlum. Uh, <clears throat> it allows us to divide very, very large tables into smaller, more manageable chunks. Each of these chunks, as we mentioned previously, uh, via the uh, <clears throat> each partition can have its own storage attributes. So we'll come back to that here in the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> we achieve our performance gains uh, with partitioning by doing what we call partition elimination. So when you've uh, partitioned by a range or list, as you can see as the two types here, uh, typically a range might be a month or a date sort of thing, and a list would be, say, a list of states or something else that may be within your business where it's a, a finite <coughs> defined list of items. Uh, <coughs> in range partitioning, you set up the time frame that you'd like in each slice, if you will, uh, each partition, uh, then is bounded by those um, dates. We also support subpartitioning, and as you can see here on the right, uh, we have in fact partitioned our order table by order date in a monthly fashion, yielding 12 partitions instead of one functionally with a full table. A little bit more actively here, here you can see we're doing a count from the order line items table. On the left side, we have not partitioned at all. On the right side, we have partitioned by range, presumably by date uh, for a month again. So here we are selecting uh, where order date time is between the 1st of November and the 2nd of November. As you can see, on the left side, we have to select all the data from every segment. And on the right, we can only select, we select only from the table that represents November. Now back to our polymorphic storage example. Uh, we have a table, overall table called sales. In this case, we partition it again based on a range, uh, monthly it looks like on the left side. And then as you can see, the partition definitions change as the data gets older. Uh, the other interesting things that you can do here uh, are change the orientation. So on the left, you see uh, June, July, August, I'll have row-oriented data, if you will. Uh, frequently, we'll see this uh, as heap tables or row-based tables uh, are faster in doing updates and deletes than columnar uh, and compressed tables, which we'll discuss next. Uh, finally, we uh, frequently see indexes being used in these row-oriented tables that have, quote, hot or more current data. In the middle of the slide here, you'll see that we've, we've flipped the orientation of this data that has become not stale necessarily, but probably not being updated anymore into a columnar orientation. Uh, we can also apply uh, compression at this level uh, by a number of different algorithms, including gzip, uh, quicklz, uh, nrle. Uh, <clears throat> and columnar can be extremely powerful uh, for improving query performance uh, for certain types of queries. So another reason you might do that. And then finally off on the right side, uh, we see year minus one and year minus two, which again have different partition definitions. Again, the power of the partitioning uh, functionality inside of GreenPlum uh, allows us to take that older data, perhaps apply uh, greater levels of compression or even store it external to our storage or to our clusters storage in something like Amazon S3. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about external tables. Again, Pravin mentioned this earlier, a very powerful component of the GreenPlum uh, environment. You'll see a typical GreenPlum cluster here with the master on the left, the switches interconnect, if you will, there in the gray bar in the middle, and then a number of segment hosts. Off on the right, this time we have something that's new, which is a, a kind of an ETL environment. Uh, mind you, this does not have to be Informatica or any of the other major ETL players. It can simply be servers that, that serve the purpose for uh, uh, providing data to your database for loading. Uh, so on the external table or on the ETL server, we have a, a couple of processes. In this case, we've listed GPF dist as the primary process. However, you can see we support a number of other protocols, including HDFS. 
which gives us direct access to data on Hadoop. Uh, PXF, the Pivotal, Pivotal Extension Framework, which allows us uh, and you to write your own extenders and connectors for different types of data. At this point, PXF supports a number of uh, uh, Hadoop data types, including Parquet. Uh, and finally, we have an S3 protocol as well that allows you to reach off into cloud storage. Uh, the long and short of this we'll cover on the next couple of slides, but basically uh, when you've defined these external tables, you can either bring the data into the database by doing an insert or a load operation, or you can actually leave the data completely external and use it as if the data were local to your database uh, and use them in queries. On the left, we'll see the syntax for our external table uh, creation. On the top, you'll see a readable external table, which is the default. On the bottom, you'll see a writable, which means yes, we can in fact take data from the database and write it back out for export purposes. A um, Couple of things, uh, like a regular create table, we have to give it a column definitions. Uh, in this case, we're using the like clause to say it is like a base table in the database. The next, uh, statement is the location statement, and there can be one or more of these clauses, if you will. Uh, the GPF disk can be repeated multiple times, either on multiple hosts or to represent multiple files. Next, we tell the format, which in this case, um, as with the Postgres copy command, has to be either text or CSV. And then we tell it something about the data, what it's delimited by, what the comma character, what the quote character might be, how to deal with nulls, etc. Uh, then we suggest logging of errors, and then we say at which point do we want to just skip this operation because there have been too many errors, that would be the segment reject limit. On the right side, you see a couple of examples of using these tables. As I said, uh, you can either leave data external to the database, or as in this top insert statement, you can actually insert into the database from the external table. And I'll let you take a look at the other two examples. Finally, uh, <clears throat> you can't have a parallel environment without a parallel backup and restore. Uh, we support a number of uh, ways in which to do this. Uh, GP cron dump and GPDB restore are longtime utilities that are based on their Postgres counterparts uh, and functionally are just parallel uh, instances of PG dump and PG restore. Uh, <clears throat> a number of things, but functionally it works very similar to the way Postgres backs things up. Uh, there are some locks taken. Uh, you can be, uh, pick and choose which pieces you wish to back up, either starting at the database level or going down to the schema or even the table level. Um, <clears throat> we support uh, a number of outputs, if you will, for the backups, including local disk, a data domain with a deduplication feature, net backup, or any POSIX mount points, such as an NFS mount point. Uh, and finally, down at the bottom, we have new utilities that came out in the last uh, few months, GP Backup and G GP Restore, which are custom work from our R&D group, ground up, green plum native backup and restore utilities. A lot more flexibility, uh, less locking and uh, contention on the system catalog. Uh, <clears throat> the files can be exported into a CSV format so you can do more interesting things than you could with the old formats, uh, and of course, improve performance. A little bit about extensions and uh, deployment options. So on the open source and the commercial side of things, uh, <clears throat> well, actually, on the open source side, you won't find Command Center, which we'll take a look at next, uh, nor will you find GP Text, which is full text in indexing uh, based on Solar. Uh, and full search support for Lucene. Uh, you will get parallel uh, utilities such as Start Stop, GPSSH, and GPSCP, which allow you to do parallel operations across the entire cluster using familiar SSH and SCP interfaces. Uh, a few others, uh, GP Config, which allows for configuration changes to be made across the cluster, and GP Segment Install, which allows you to install the software in a single statement across the entire cluster. Uh, finally, coming soon, we'll have PKS for Greenplum, which is a Kubernetes-based service for Greenplum.
Here's just a quick view of the dashboard from Green Plum Command Center. This is version 3.3. We've just recently released version 4.0. Has some nice additional features uh, as we keep revving this product and, and trying to add functionality that, that helps out uh, our customers, the database administrators. In terms of deployment, uh, Green Plum's really leading the way. We have uh, marketplace offerings for Amazon, Google, and Azure, uh, as well as support in your private cloud, should you choose to go that way. In terms of on-premise hardware, we support uh, both SUSE and Red Hat. Uh, we provide both archives, uh, uh, RPM type archives or binaries for installation. And uh, should you want to do developer instances, you can use apt-get on Ubuntu. Very powerful, very flexible platform. And lastly, a few resources to take away. Uh, links to the Amazon and Azure marketplace offerings. Uh, a link to a book written by our own Marshall Presser, uh, which is a nice intro to Green Plum and data warehousing. Finally, uh, links to the master documentation archive for Green Plum and a link to Madlib, uh, where all of the algorithms that are supported in Madlib are listed out. Take a minute for some questions. Really appreciate your time today and your support.